Professor Murtasen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's really great to talk to you. I must say that this book, Home in the World, uh, both Radhika and I read it, and I tell you, we just loved it. It's one of the finest books I have read. We both have read, actually. Um, we laughed a lot. There are huge, terrifically funny bits in it. We learned a lot. And we also cried a bit here and there. You know, it's, it's quite emotional at parts. And uh, one issue to start with is the book stops in 1963 when you're 30 years old. And so there are two questions. One is, we hope there's going to be part two because we want to read Amartya Sen post 30 years old. And did you really focus on this area of Burma, Dhaka, Calcutta, uh, Shanti Niketan, Cambridge, MIT, Stanford, Delhi School of Economics? Because did you focus on this period first? Because in many ways, they appear to be the foundation uh, of a lot of your ideas and thoughts in life. Is that the reason why you kind of did this first part of your life, first three decades? One reason that uh, most of my values and priorities have uh, by then had, had emerged and come clearly. And it became clear to me particularly when I was um, uh, with... Um, uh, at the Delhi School of Economics in comparing how I see the world and how did my students see the world. There was an interesting and important comparison there. And then and, and that was, for me, rather consolidating uh, as far as um, uh, what, what I felt I was increasingly standing for, uh, including coming from the left of the political spectrum, but also very concerned that um, the issue of individual liberty may be neglected in a way that we shouldn't allow uh, it to happen. So I think all these concerns were there. And uh, I think by the time I'm in Delhi School of Economics, and my students are interacting with me, uh, that became quite clear. So in many ways, yes, this was the foundation of your uh, being home in the world, at home in the world. Yeah, it yeah. was those 30 years, I guess, really. But, you know, one of the things that struck us in the book is friendship. And that you had so many wonderful friends all over the world. And um, you would spend lots of time arguing, chatting, drinking, dancing. Basically, friendship was very important. Uh, amazing. And you write about friendship. And this is from your book. I sometimes think that so much has been written in literature about love and so little about friendship that there's a real need to redress the balance without trying to redefine friendship under some kind of broadened umbrella of love when they are not really the same thing at all. I was immensely happy and friendship meant a lot to you. Is that right? Yeah, indeed. Very much so. Yeah. Friendship, closeness, learning from others, as well as relying on others. I think one thing friendship does is to give a notion that um, when you encounter a person, your inclination is to treat that person as being on your side in some ways. And, you know, I sometimes I'm lucky. I, I think I discussed uh, one of the chapters, uh, I think the chapter in your, that I miss my train going to uh, Warsaw, and I didn't have any money at all. And there I am in the East Berlin station and not knowing exactly what to do. And there I was a friend. He happened to be a student studying 
electrical engineering uh, in, in, in Berlin. And uh, he becomes a supporter, a friend, and, and company. Uh, yeah. that, Wonderful. Uh, I remember that whole, and then he waited for you when you came back at the station. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Well, he insisted that I may get into problem again. I think I have to be taken the next way. Right. And the other, you know, uh, as an academic, people thought, okay, you read a lot, you spend a lot of time in libraries, which you did and you enjoyed it. But you also mentioned, uh, you say a very positive thing about teaching, teaching students. And you said, in fact, I was learning so much from teaching that I felt convinced I could not really be sure of knowing a subject well until I tried to teach it to others. And then you say a wonderful thing, uh, which uh, being an ex-Delhi School of Economics person, actually one of the big regrets I had at Delhi School of Economics, I came there just after you had left. So I missed your teaching, and I, but I did hear your lectures when you used yeah, to visit so there I, in other parts of the yeah. world. But you did say this about Delhi School. The thrill I experienced from teaching my astonishingly talented students in Delhi is hard to describe. I expected them to be of high quality, but they turned out to be much more than that. Delhi School of Economics, and you taught people at Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, uh, MIT and uh, Stanford, and you still say that about Delhi School? Oh, I certainly would say that, yeah. In, at, at different levels. I, I taught both uh, the elementary you know, like social choice theory um, and um, I think both in terms of the innovative work on social choice theory that people like Prasanta Patnaik and others did, uh, that was fantastic, but also in the general class of elementary economics, there was a is kind of level of interest, uh, concern, engagement that I found right across the big lecture hall, which I found uh, enormously uh, energizing. And right, right. So I think I, if I were to put them in next to Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard, they might see. I don't know where exactly they might be in terms of exact performance and score, but in terms of being engaged in the subject matter, I think yes. I was doing as much as I could expect. And I will, may I add one more thing to that? When I taught at Delhi School of Economics, I did find students from presidency the best. Now, I might be a bit biased coming from Calcutta, but I used to find the presidency students little above the rest. The standard was generally wonderfully high, very high IQ. I think the students were better than us teachers, actually. Just coming to the Nobel Prize and uh, the amazing, uh, what they read out about you is just wonderful. But they also asked you uh, to donate to two things that were important to you in your life to their museum. And you write, I was made to reflect on all this when the Nobel Foundation asked me to give them on long-term loan two objects that have been closely associated with my work to, do, to be displayed in the Nobel Museum. After some dithering, I gave the Nobel Museum a copy of Arya Bhatia, one of the great Sanskrit classics on mathematics from AD 499, from which I had benefited so much and my old bicycle, which had been with me since my school days. I explained those two gifts uh, to the Nobel Museum. <laughs> okay. Well, the bicycle first, perhaps. Yes. Because quite a lot of my work is empirical, and I had to gather data, and many of the um, subjects I was working in, we didn't have already uh, collected data, I had to get get them uh, very often for myself, whether I'm dealing with gender inequality, how girls and boys comparatively favor, uh, comparatively 
um, perform like, as they are getting older from a very early age. And also, going back to history, what happened during the famine? How right. much did the wages of people compared with prices fall to make it impossible for them to buy food? So I was collecting all these things, going to all storages and 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 go down, as they say in India, and trying to right. get all, all uh, records out. And I had to do it on a bike because there were long distances, mostly not very well connected. But the Ayurvatiya was a book of great interest to me. It was by the author was Ayurvat, who was a uh, one of the great um, uh, mathematicians in, in right. India. And the real mathematics in India begins. It's, uh, uh, you know, people talk about uh, Vedic mathematics and so on, but they're not really of major uh, achievement that we can talk about. I have had, it's not uninfluenced by outsiders. I think what's happening in Greek and Greece and Babylon do have some impact in India. But this is picked up bit by bit by a number of people in the first couple of centuries in the uh, 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 in uh, in in different parts of India, Ayurveda himself um, did spend most of his life later in 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 Patna in Pataliputra, but I think he came originally from Kerala, and he had a great interest in that, and he's not only were doing major mathematics but also made a speculation about the nature of the world, including Actually, yes. the likelihood of gravity being there. Right. Actually, yes, you were primarily interested in mathematics, in philosophy, and we'll come to how you suddenly switched to economics. And we are so thankful for that. But while we talk about the Nobel Prize from economics, I want to just assure all youngsters out there don't be disheartened. You can still win the Nobel Prize no matter how you're doing in school because you describe an experience when after the Nobel Prize, you went back to Dhaka and you went to your old school and this is what happened as you describe in your book. You said um, it was St. Gregory's and you said, when I visit, visited Dhaka shortly after the Nobel Award in December in 1998, the headmaster of St. Gregory's put on a special celebration for me. He mentioned that to inspire the current students, he had fished out my exam papers from storage, but was discouraged when he saw that the performance ranked 33rd in a class of 37. Then he added kindly, I suppose you become a good student only after you left St. Gregory's. The headmaster was not mistaken. I became what would count as a good student only when no one cared whether I was a good student or not. So I think all the students who may not be top of their class right now, don't worry, you can still win a Nobel Prize. But you didn't like the pressure, right? I didn't like Professor Sethney. And St. Gregory was a very high performing. <laughs> right, yeah. They used to be proud of the fact that the position from 1 to 10 standardly of the Dhaka board exam were occupied by St. Gregory's. And then they were special, and they did very well in that. Uh, I found it uh, upsetting because I didn't want to do only one day. They wanted me to do, I wanted to read on my own. And Santini Ketan gave that. When I arrived there, I could just read what I liked. I could not be forced to. Right. Uh, Wonderful. I would say one thing, though, uh, if, if I may for now. Yes. Uh, I think our students should feel that they can do extremely well in the world. But I don't think Nobel is a good way of judging it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think because, you know, it, it's a prize, and there are other prizes, and there are other ways of 
making a mark in the world. Exactly. Uh, including uh, influencing the lives of others, improving the lives of others. Right. So, right. so right. I think, I think um, just as there is a danger of being um, too steamrolled by others, there is a danger of having a kind of single file. Uh, yes, yes. In terms. yes. I was very happy to get the Nobel Prize because they gave me some money with which I could do some real donation for which I had no money at all. So the Fertichis Trust India and Fertichis Trust Bangladesh could be started with the Nobel money. With your Nobel money, yes. Yeah, that was a very good thing. Now, of course, life has become very difficult in order to get money uh, donation from, say, abroad. Uh, the huge barriers to be crossed. Uh, but uh, the people are interested. Uh, you could collaborate with others in, right, in expanding right. these works. And talking about money, you, you did have a pretty tough student life. I remember uh, you wanted to go to Italy and there was a National Students Union special package of only 50 pounds to go to uh, Italy. And it yeah. took everything, you had to cut back on everything just to raise that uh, 50 pound. But you yeah. had friends mm-hmm. and you went with friends. And I must say you do write quite a lot that you went on one or two holidays. With, there were four boys and 18 girls. Uh, you know, we won't well, go. If I took, I had 18 girls and, and four boys. You're right. right. But, uh, and you learned about global amity uh, over a glass of wine where they said, you know, countries may be far apart geographically. That's what you write, but we want them, to, everybody to be neighbors at heart sort of thing. Is that right, roughly? This was a German girl I, uh, I met uh, along with her companions in, in Rudersheim. Right. Uh, I was taking the boat. I took cheaper journeys that I could, and this was going down the line at a student fair, right. uh, but some students traveling with me, I said, do you know about the Rudesheim fair? So I said, no. So they said, we are all getting off, so I got off there. I, right. uh, I went and joined in the pub, and there were some very active uh, students there who began with elementary questions when they learned that uh, the part of India I come from, Bengal is old name is Bongo. They wanted to know whether it was anywhere near Congo. Whether Bongo was near Congo? Whether. whether <laughs> it is. And I think that, that it isn't. And on a, uh, on a napkin, I had to draw a map of that. But one of the German girls there was very keen that all countries would get together. I first thought he wanted men geographically, but it turns out that he wanted collaboration with people. You have to understand that only a few years earlier, uh, Germany and he was really terrorizing the world in, in, in terms of uh, making uh, normal life impossible among right. neighbors and elsewhere. And uh, I think this is a kind of reaction which was very strong in Germany uh, uh, and which is a saving grace. Right. And, yeah. While we're on that, Again, you had friends that were on holidays, but a lot of very close friends as a student, as a teacher, as a professor. Uh, One of the friends was Aung San Suu Kyi, who was really, uh, in the early days, an absolutely an inspiration to all of us. We used to carry her on World This Week, and it was just amazing. What was she like? I tell you, uh, this is what you wrote. I knew Suu Kyi as a fearless leader. And I felt very fortunate in knowing such a remarkable and brave person who tolerated awful harassment and prolonged incarceration to fight for the cause of democracy in Burma. Then what changed? Well, that's a, that's a puzzle to me because there was a change of personality um, in the in, in what happened. Um, first of all, she seemed to stand for the nation of 
Vava, but right. will not include Rohingyas who were residents of Vama for a very long time anyway. So there was a kind of discrimination in a way you couldn't find in, say, Mahatma Gandhi or, 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 or William Rathibo. So there was a, a kind of slight narrowness there. I think a more than slight narrowness. I think also the military played with her very powerfully and made it clear that they would they could carry out propaganda, which they did, which would make most Buddhists turn against uh, the Muslim Rohingyas, so that once this propaganda is successful, if Aung San Suu Kyi said things in favor of Rohingyas, then she would lose not only support of the military, but also of the Buddhist general population. They played it very smartly. We tend to underestimate often the intelligence of the, uh, yes. the yes. Nazi people. And in this case, the Burmese military is about the Nazi, yes, you can get to. They managed to um, uh, produce a system whereby um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was really caught in a trap made by the military. Right, right. Now, that was not the only thing. She remained powerful and she remained at least um, uh, uh, a heroically um, uh, daring character. Those but can I just interrupt? When you knew her, uh, she was like for all of us an inspiration to you. What kind of a person was she as a friend? Well, she was a student in Delhi University, so I knew her also then. She was a student in, in Oxford, uh, and uh, I knew her English husband, who was also very uh, uh, concerned with uh, uh, equity across the world. She was among very good people. Uh, right. And, uh, Big change, yeah. Uh, and then I think I think gradually came, the military decided that to get the husband uh, effectively separated from her would break her, which it nearly did. Uh, and also by planting this Buddhist versus Muslim Rohingya uh, yeah. no, story. Terribly sad. Sad change, yes, but yeah. let's hope. <laughs> on, really. So I, 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 it's not to the credit of, of, of um, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, that the military could play her on their, on her, on their finger. Uh, and, right. and, and, and that's very unfortunate. Right. Now, you clearly have a terrible dislike for uh, military and the army and autoc autocracy and dictatorship. But the military in particular, I, I feel I want to go back to your early days in school and there's a little incident you write and I think the anti-military point of view was so with that incident. You write as follows. The Subadar Major told us that the bullet accelerates after leaving the rifle and then after a while it starts to slow down. And that's best to hit the object to be struck when the bullet is traveling at its maximum speed. At that point, I found myself raising my hand and offering some Newtonian mechanics, telling our Subhadar Major that the bullet could not possibly accelerate after leaving the rifle since there's no new force to make it gain velocity. The Subhadar looked at me and said, are you saying I'm wrong? I wanted to give him the only possible answer to the question, namely yes, but that seemed unwise. I also thought that in fairness, I should concede that the bullet could possibly accelerate if its rotary movement could somehow be converted into a linear forward movement. But I had to add, I could not see how that would occur. The Sobhadar responded by giving me an angry glance and saying, rotary movement? Is that what you're saying? Before I could clear up that muddle point, 
he ordered me to raise my arm above my hand with the unloaded rifle held high and run around the field five times in a rotary movement after that you left <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah how could you like the military after glorious, that glorious recollection but it did happen yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lasting yeah. memories lasting impact all the dislike the military even when i was this is happened in the national cadet corps and there wasn't a great achievement i think on my part Yeah, but but my dislike of military, of course, is much more extensive than yes. that. Yes, yes, of course. I just wanted to move on to another very important topic, especially for us, um, and that is the importance of a free media in any country. And uh, you talk about the importance of uh, how the uh, Bengal fam- famine. happened as was extended and got much worse because the media was suppressed uh both in england and here and uh, this is what you write the fact is that even as bengal was ravaged by a famine the likes of which had not been seen since the 18th century at the beginning of the british rule in bengal neither the parliament in westminster nor the ever active british newspapers had sufficiently extensive reports or discussions about it indeed the british public was kept amazingly uninformed the high bengal high circulation bengali newspapers were as i've said censored and the grand english newspaper of calcutta the statesman which was british owned and edit, edited by a loyal englishman ian stevens voluntarily chose a policy of not discussing the famine in the inst- instant interest of solidarity for the war effort the informational blackout only ended when ian stevens revolted in october 1943 he saw clearly that he was betraying his profession he was a journalist but was writing nothing about the most important calamity around him The statesman published vitriolic attacks on the British policy regarding the famine with news coverage providing evidence. The British Parliament had not discussed the man-made disaster before Stevens spoke. All that changed immediately after the statesman's reporting. And writing about today you say that altogether different reasons of authoritarian d- domestic politics the restrictions are sometimes no less intrusive now than during the colonial rule yeah. so there was both censorship as well as voluntary so called restraint not yeah. being ju- proper journalists right yes and that sometimes the voluntary restraint could come from a sense of patriotism and that of course uh, ian steven thought he had mistakenly invited uh, but sometimes it also comes from fear for government intervention right i mean uh, i was pleased to see that the chief justice of the supreme court raising the question that 75 years after the end of the uh, british colonial rule why do we need some of these colonial provisions like preventive detention for example preventive detention was a great um uh, tool of harassment and 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 keeping country in check uh, right. during the british raj and uh, a large number of my relations were in prison at that time without uh, being there being any conviction but we all thought that once the war once the colonial rule ended then they will go and it's not to the credit of the government that came in immediately that the congress government not to eliminate them why why what was the need to keep them why could not they have eradicated all the rules whether it be preventive detention or it be the criminality of homosexual behavior all these were british rules which could have been eliminated but what has happened 
is that what was present, but not very powerfully uh, executed, uh, now is executed often with very strong force. And a lot of people I know, uh, extremely respectable people, extremely non-violent people, being locked up uh, using that. And the argument given is, well, these rules were there, even under Congress, and now it could be applied more. I think the question that the new Chief Justice raises is, is, is a legitimate one, namely, okay, but 75 years have gone since colonial rule ended. Why do you need the, uh, the, in, uh, the instruments of suppression that the colonial rule has needed now? You're not ruling a colony, you're ruling a democracy. So I think that is a very big thing, and that's not uh, um, uh, the force behind is is connected with uh, uh, driving um, a bit of terror yeah, to the. To I mean, the, it is amazing that you're comparing what was done under the British colonial system with what is happening now. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, we were all convinced. You see, I was growing up in. Uh, in, under British rule in my school days. Right. And, and uh, we were all convinced that as soon as India becomes independent, all these would go. But they didn't go. And now it has got much strengthened and applied very often uh, in, in a way that uh, I think is really shameful in terms of what um, we could have expected as citizens of a democratic country, the first democracy in a non-white society in the world. Uh, one question on this, um, the world keeps talking about democracy and their anti-dictatorship, but they never seem to actually do anything. We've seen dictators rising in many countries and uh, the West keeps trading with them and really does just, you know, occasionally says, you know, well, duck, duck, but doesn't actually do anything. Uh, it would be Burma or Saudi Arabia or, or Brazil. You could see uh, authoritarianism become stronger and people who are mounting servants against authoritarianism all the time not doing anything about accepting trade with these countries. Right. Uh, that is a real uh, gap in the moral climate of the world today. And, and, and we have to think really about that. Right. So um, you're talking about British colonial rule, but, you know, we've just seen uh, a football match where they lost and they were really, uh, there was horrible anti, I mean, uh, racist comments on Twitter and various other places. And now uh, Hamilton won a race with a little controversial accident and the racist comments against him. I want to go back. How much has changed? Because um, I want to ask you about the British landlady who you stayed with when you first arrived in England, uh, in Cambridge, and you're not allowed to be in. The rule was in the first year, you're not allowed to live in the college. And you write this amazing incident of how she changed. And I want to know whether the British have changed like your landlady. You write, it turned out that Mrs. Hanger, that was the landlady, Hanger's fear of colored people had some rational basis in her understanding of science. On my first day, after welcoming, welcomingly, warmly, she popped the question, will your color come off in the bath? I mean, a really hot bath. Will your color come off? <laughs> she says, and then, but after the year you spent, you obviously had an impact on her because she says, when I came to say, uh, you write, when I came to say goodbye to her in June, 1954, she gave me a cup of tea with some homemade cake saying she would miss me. She went, went on to say some very progressive things on race relations and described how she had ticked off an English woman at a dance club where they used to go regularly 
for not wanting to dance with an African man who was waiting to find a partner. And she said, I was very upset. So I grabbed the man and danced with him for more than an hour until he wanted to go home. I mean, you certainly had an impact on her and changed her, but uh, there's still an underlying kind of racism in England and in America um, yeah. that hasn't changed like your uh, landlady. Yeah, and of course there is that in India too. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, against uh, schedule cars. Uh, yes. You know, the Dalits and, and schedule cars. And, and indeed many other people, uh, people of other religions like Islam and so on. And so I think there are two types of issues. One is how to stop discrimination against human beings who happen to be citizens or residents of a country. And, and that can be done by uh, discussion, by um, um, uh, bringing it into a public sphere of, of discussion. I think in this respect, uh, both Gandhi and Tagore uh, offer great examples of how you could make a change, uh, talking with people, saying, why do you say that, and so on. That's one kind of issue. But the other kind of issue is to take on other countries uh, which are, they're not living with you. So the Arabian and the Burmese military are not living uh, with English uh, upper classes or American upper classes. And right. if they still support uh, the, the kind of rather horrifying um, uh, of, of these terrorizing groups, then the question arises, what stops you is not that you have to accept them uh, to your bosom. Right, right. Which right. Uh, it is important, but in a different context, like the Mrs. Hanger context. Uh, right. That, uh, my, uh, so I think we have to distinguish them. The Mrs. Hanger context, if I may come back to it, uh, it, it, what it taught me is this, that when you come to know a person well, uh, it's very difficult to maintain irrational prejudices again. I knew that things were changing when about a month or so after uh, my being in Mrs. Hanger's uh, bed and breakfast, she came and she said, you know, Martha, you are, you are very lean, uh, you, you're really sickly. I think you're sick. You, you, should, be, you should become uh, uh, more healthy. Uh, we have to build <laughs> you up. And, and, and of course, our science wasn't entirely perfect. So she decided I must drink some full fat milk. I couldn't explain to her that full fat milk would not improve my health in any <laughs> way. But she got them at her own expense every morning. And she came to me and she said, you have to drink oh, for my sake every morning. Wow. For this milk. <laughs> now, she would suddenly, instead of trying to find out how uh, to deal with the color emanating from my body, <laughs> while I was in the hot bath, Nancy was concerned about how to make me uh, become but... healthier. So I think, I think this is the point that I, with which actually the book ends, that um, is the point really of Adam Smith in the context of impartial spectator. If you imagine that you have arrived and you mix with these people, what would you feel? And Smith's understanding was, that if you mix with them, if you get together with them, this is the point, by the way, that David Hume also make, uh, then indeed something of their well-being, concern, concern about their well-being, right. will influence you. And when right. that happens, uh, your outlook will change. 
Right. Uh, at least your landlady didn't offer you sherry. And I should warn everybody, whoever uh, invites you to a party, do not offer Professor Amot Persen sherry because his professor did once. And what did you do with that sherry that he gave you? <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid that poured it into a flower pot. You poured yes. it into a flower pot. He saw your empty, empty glass, gave you another sherry. And what did you do with that glass <laughs> of sherry? Same, same flower pot. <laughs> so then I kept on watching. Uh, <laughs> I visited him, whether the flowers were coming out all right. And the flowers flourished. Yes. So I think oh, you should think well. of... <laughs> flowers flourished and you should think of having sherry from now on. Or maybe okay. there are better alternatives. Okay. I just wanted to kind of come uh, wrap around to your family and how much influence everybody had on you, your mother, your father, and your grandfather in particular. And uh, you, you write about him. You had many discussions on the existence of God. And, you, and when you were a child, you said, I enjoyed hearing my grandfather at the weekly mandir, at least initially. But I found no particular attraction to a weekly religious or at least semi-religious discourse. By the time I was 12, I told my grandfather I did not want to come to the Mandir assemblies regularly for I had work to do. He, and I suppose he told me, but he didn't sound particularly hurt. You do not enjoy these discussions at the Mandir. I was silent, you write. He said, there is no case for having religious convictions until you are able to think seriously for yourself. It will come to you in a natural way over time. Now, since religious convictions did not come to me at all as I grew older, my skepticism only seemed to mature with age. I told my grandfather some years later that he might have been wrong that religion had not come to me over time, despite my persistent attempts to think about the different issues that religion tries to resolve. I was not mistaken, replied my grandfather. You have addressed the religious question and you have placed yourself, I can see, in the atheistic, the lokayata part of the Hindu spectrum. So he put your atheism still within the Hindu spectrum. Yeah, yeah. There's no escape from that. Because, <laughs> uh, to him, there were these different schools of thought, uh, I'd better say right and so on. And, and, and of course, atheism and Lukata is one of them. In fact, in the 14th century, when uh, um, Mother Vacharya writes a wonderful book, and I do, I do recommend to the listeners in NDTV, the book, uh, it's available in specifically better translation, which I'm trying to arrange. Uh, but it, it begins, the first chapter is on the Lokata. It's called Sarvadas and Sangaha, collection of all philosophy, meant to be local Indian philosophy. And chapter one is on atheism. And it's, it's a visible exposition about the logic behind the materialist position in, in the Locata airport. And, and so what uh, my grandfather was doing was not to chuck that as being not acceptable and out, but as one of the lines of thought, not his line of thought, not one that he would recommend. On the other hand, it is a legitimate line of thought that one can think about. And that's how right. Mother Vacharya in 14th century right. treats it. And I, I think if you think about the things to be proud of in the Indian culture, this is one of them, that uh, the toleration right. has not uh, easily uh, seen in many countries uh, of very different times. I mean, the, when Abba was talking about multi-religious tolerance, uh, this is when uh, yes. uh, the, in, 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 in Rome, um, uh, heretics were being burned in Campo di Fiori. 
uh, and, and and that's exactly when Agwa is talking in Agwa about the need to have a multi-religious tolerant perspective. I think right. that's a long tradition of India. Right. Uh, moved away from that quite a bit. And that's another way to regret for me. You know, I mean, uh, we think of Shanti Niketan when I read your book, it, 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 is, it transformed your life. It is, a, it is just a, such a wonderful place. It just strengthened every nook and corner of talent anybody had. So I was thinking, you know, uh, I would ask you to sing uh, a Rabindu Shongit because, you know, Shanti Niketan, you must sing beautifully. Until I read a, uh, one of the uh, anecdotes you write in your book, and I'll just read out what you said. And you said, I loved and I continue to love listening to music, including good singing. But I myself could not sing at all. My music teacher, a wonderful singer, who we called Mohordi, her real name was Konika Bandopadhyay, did not accept that I was simply deficient and initially refused to excuse me from the class. She told me, everyone has a talent for singing. It's just a matter of practice. Encouraged by Mohordi's theory, I did some quite serious practice. I was sure about my efforts, but wondered what I was achieving. After a month or so of practice, Mohordi tested my performance again, and then with defeat writ large on her face, she told me, Homorto, you need not come to the music class anymore. <laughs> so okay. I would love you to sing. Would you like to sing? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, okay. Yeah. But at least you tried and at least she did kind of have faith in your No, I, indeed. I, I like listening to music very yeah. much indeed. And that would Hopefully, be with me <laughs> all the way. Hmm. Coming to Calcutta, because that's another transformational uh, place in your life. Uh, Calcutta is my favorite city, born and brought up there. And the people of Calcutta are the best in India by far. I just want to just give me a couple of sentences on what Calcutta means to you and meant to you. Well, this is where I had my uh, taste of argument developed, uh, whether it be in the coffee house next to presidency college or sitting at a... The coffee uh, house, yeah. Coffee, yeah, coffee house is a big institution. Uh, where I developed my taste for argument. I had some of that in Santa Niketan, but the fact that it's not just a matter of uh, reflecting disagreement, but actually advancing your argument. If somebody says, uh, you believe that, but how would you uh, justify that? That's a legitimate question. And I, in, in a vague way, I knew that that must be the case, but it is in Calcutta coffee house or in the, or in the veranda of presidency college. Right. With friends in the Madan. Uh, yeah, I argue. So, me. Calcutta, you know, and if you're in <laughs> Calcutta and you're sitting in the coffee house or at presidency, and football must mean everything to you because football is the life and soul of the sports in that city. And, you know, what amazes me, it must have come from your does the way you thought about football and related it to economics and analysis. And you write, and again, I'll just quote, because I love the way you write, and it, it's made so clear, so it's no point me trying to repeat it. So this is what you say. The results of the Mohan Bagan versus East Bengal games had some evident economic consequences, including on the relative prices of different types of fish in Calcutta. Since most ghotis like best a fish called Rui, and Bangals from the East typically have a deep loyalty to Ilish, Rui would tend to shoot up in price if Mohan Bagan won, leading to celebratory dinners by Westerners. Similarly, the price of Ilish would leap up if East Bengal defeated Mohan Bagan. I did not know that I might someday specialize in economics. 
I was quite strongly hooked at that time on mathematics and physics with only Sanskrit as a possi- possible rival. But the elementary economics of price rise due to a sudden hike in demand was immediately interesting. I even speculated on a primitive theory that this volatility should not in general be present if the result of the game was firmly predictable. Now, I mean, you know, that's a li- that is coffee house gem. I mean, it generated from the coffee house, right? It's a near, yeah. I should say, I'm not my personally particularly fond of football. I've never been. Right. I, I think the only game that I had some. You went to one match, I think, when you were 10, you were right. That I uh, watched. Uh, in you watched, yeah, yeah. The only game I played is is cricket, uh, and uh, they tolerable batsman. Now I just uh, got to ask you about that cricket very quickly. Uh, your the captain bowled at you to test your batting, and you hit a, such a hard shot it hit your captain on the nose, and he either broke his nose or at least he was bleeding. How did you manage to carry on after that? Well, I was trying to. I just arrived from Dhaka to Fantinikesa and my cousin was trying to get me recruited in their team. Okay. We were like seven, eight, seven, eight, nine, and so on. And uh, so the captain gave me a trial and sent me a ball and <laughs> I did the best I could to hit the ball back. Unfortunately, he hit him on the nose and he was <laughs> bleeding. And I, I thought... Uh, I thought I, he would not let me join his team. But instead of that, he said, okay, uh, your cousin can join my team, definitely. On the other hand, tell him not to aim at the bowler's nose. <laughs> <laughs> and you were uh, right. uh, married to a, a, a poet and a, 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 a person who studied poetry, and you love poetry, and a person came... Actually, uh, a budding poet came to your house to recite some hundred poems to your wife. And it was a humbling experience because you write, on one occasion, a poet arrived with a substantial collection of poems, wanting to read them aloud to Nobunita, that's your wife and poet, and to receive her critical judgment. But since she was not at home, the poet said he would settle instead for reading several hundred poems to me. Yeah. When I pleaded that I altogether lacked literary sophistication, I was assured by him, he said. But that's absolutely perfect. I'm especially interested in seeing how the common man, the unsophisticated common man reacts to my poetry. <laughs> and you say I'm happy to report that the common man reacted with dignity and self-control. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. so he, he, so you are an unsophisticated common man. I see. I am an unsophisticated common man who happens to enjoy poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so, what did you say to him after you heard 150 poems? <laughs> well, <laughs> you were asleep. He was very happy that I listened to it, and words of praise are easier to. Okay, I'm going to give one last anecdote from your school days again. Uh, you said I, I, about sports. You, I was a tolerable, tolerable batsman, but not a bowler. I was quite hopeless at fielding. I became, however, a champion at the sack race, which used to appear in sports competition partly to provide some fun, but also gave unathletic students like me something to do in, on sports day. And here you go with your analysis. You say, my success in the sack race was mainly the result of a theory I developed that is hopeless to try and proceed by jumping forward. You will always fall. But you can, with some stability, shuffle forward with your toes in the two corners of the sack with little danger of falling. Since on the day of independence, 15th, August 1947, the only sport offered in the celebrations was the sack race. I had the extraordinary experience of emerging as the sports champion on that momentous day. The prize was the peak of my athletic glory. 
Sacris. <laughs> but again, analysis, don't jump. You know, I'm sure you use yeah. exactly yeah. the same kind of uh, analytic. <laughs> and you won. Uh, I did. Uh, <laughs> several times, in fact. <laughs> yeah. Right. I think we'll just end with those because um, nobody knows these uh, lovely little anecdotes, which, which I've just taken snippets out of, and it's so really fascinating. Um, but honestly, I could go on like this for several hours. I could even give you sherry. Oh, sorry, not sherry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wine. No, but we've run out of time. Um, but I, I just say one thing, that the book leaves me with a bit of a sad feeling. And the sad feeling is that I wish I was a little bit younger and that I was with you and a friend of yours and learned from you at that time. I wish, I wish, I wish. And I, I hope everybody who interacted with you, and I'm sure they do, really value your friendship at that time. Thank you very much. And we are waiting for the next 30 years and then the next 30 years. <laughs> Part two. Thank you very much indeed. Much Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And no. I'm not challenging you to a sack race ever. No, I, I think, yeah, the, that would be my favorite ground. Of right. <laughs> so, uh, this lovely book, Home in the world. And it's full of wonderful stories, anecdotes, and all about friendship. And every experience goes on to a, a deeper meaning. And you learn a lot from this book. Wonderful. And I'm waiting for part two. One of the finest book, books I've read. Thank you very much Thank for this you. wonderful experience. Indeed. Most grateful. Thank you.